Hello and welcome to the La Jolla Presbyterian Church Women's Bible Study for February 28th, 2018. Our teacher is Cynthia Blaze, our Director of Women's Ministries, and we're going through the story, a 31-week series through the entire Bible. This week, we're in week 22, studying chapter 22 of the story, The Birth and Childhood of Jesus. So it's Christmas in February. Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening, and have a great day. Good morning, ladies. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for coming to study with me. Okay, let's start with a prayer so that we can get our, at least I can get myself focused. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity we have to dive into your word and to dive into looking at you, which is really exciting. Thank you for this incredible journey that we have had through the Old Testament. And I pray, Father, as we look into your word and we look into um, into all that you have brought to teach us, that you will help us to understand, open our hearts and our minds to understand, help me to be able to speak your word and your truth in clarity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, so I think most of you all know I have a uh, five-and-a-half-year-old girl daughter, and actually she turns five-and-a-half on Sunday, half birthdays, uh, and then I have an eight-year-old son. And um, so the, this morning, as I was, um, I think I've told a lot of you, when I wake up, one of the things I like to do is I look at my news feed on my phone for a few minutes. I don't know. It helps me wake up or something. So Huffington Post this morning had gathered comments of people who had tweeted things, including the phrase, my six-year-old. So everything, so all these comments about people saying things about their six-year-olds. And I was just totally like giggling as I was reading through these. And I wanted to to read, there's one of them I just wanted to read to you ladies. But actually, the one above it, which is hilarious, is, um, let's see. Uh, Oh, shoot. Let's find that one. Okay. (laughs) Six-year-old. This is is a side one, but this is most funny. Six-year-old. When my play date gets here... You and her mom can just go do mom things, like drink wine and talk about Girl Scout cookies, okay? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? These were so great. I was just giggling. Um, and then this one. Daddy, I know you said to stay in my bed until 730, but that is just that, in, my, in my room, but that is taking too long. Um, so this was my first one, or the one that just killed me. Um, so, okay, six-year-old. Um, oh, sorry. It's like, it didn't give me the whole thing. Okay. It says that it says six year old just, just stepped on a spider and thought she had killed it. But when she picked her foot up, it scurried away her response. Oh my gosh. It's spider Jesus. (laughs) I was dying. I was like spider Jesus. That is what I'm just going to use from now on. It's Spider Jesus. Amazing. Okay. Um, so that was my hilarity. Um, I also um, wanted to just mention, because one of the women had asked me um, what will kind of happen after this study is done. And I want you ladies all to know that my intention is to keep teaching a Wednesday Bible study each year. And so um, I don't yet know what the church is going to be teaching next year. I, it's, I know that Paul has really enjoyed having the whole church on the same um, educational program and having our kids learning the same thing. So he may decide to do that again and have some large thing that the whole church is studying. And if so, I will follow along with that. But if he doesn't, then I thought what I would do is at the end of this season, just sort of poll you ladies and ask, what would you like to study? Are there any books that you would like to go more, more in depth on? And so that will be my plan is this study will conclude at the end of April, the end of the 31 weeks, but starting next fall, um, I will plan to for sure lead another study. So just so you can kind of plan that into your lives. Um, okay. Um, every week we have begun by me like recapping the whole Old Testament, and I am not going to do that this week. So if you want a recap of the whole Old Testament, you can go to um, number 21. And number 21 last week, I did the entire Old Testament in one in one hour. So if you want that, go to that. But what I did... Um, uh, but it's been, I think it's been a great season. I hope you ladies have learned a lot by spending the last 21 weeks studying the Old Testament, which I have loved. I thought it's been awesome. Um, and in the last 21 weeks, we have looked at the story of the Israelite people, and we have looked at their growing expectation 
that a great king is going to come and is going to save them. And today we are going to see that king arrive. Um, and one of the questions we're going to ask is, what do we learn about that king from the birth story? What do we learn about God from this birth story? And um, we, uh, in the last, especially last week, I talked a lot about the different prophecies. Um, what is this king going to be like? So I'd love, you know, you can go back and review that, but we won't go through much of that today. Um, last week, I did end by talking about the final words of Malachi. And I talked about how, so Malachi is the last prophet for 400 years. So he comes at the time that the Israelites have returned to Judea after their exile. They have rebuilt their temple. They have rebuilt Jerusalem. And they're living in relative safety in independence under the Greek empire. That's kind of where it leaves off. And Malachi gives his last and final prophecy. And then for 400 years, we have, we have no prophecy. And we call this time the intertestamental time period. So we, it's 400 years before, well, after prophecy ends with Malachi, before John the Baptist arrives on the scene and begins, and we have our first word of God, our first prophecy again. So um, I do want to review that time period today just to set the stage for Christ to arrive. So um, what were the final words of Malachi? What were the final words before, um, before prophecy ends? So let's go back and look at those for a minute. So Malachi in verse 4, 4 through 6, um, he says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. The end. That's it. <laughs> the end. Thank you. Um, so what, you know, from this, what are the Jews supposed to remember? And just shout it out. What are the Jews supposed to remember? The law of Moses. Law of Moses. Exactly. Um, so I think um, God is saying, like, you aren't going to hear from me for a while. So remember what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to remember the laws of Moses. So I think he's saying, remember your Jewish identity. Remember who you are. And um, who will come before the day of the Lord? Who's supposed to come? The prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of our great prophets of the Old Testament, so it's not that we have a reincarnation of Elijah, but the sense that a great prophet is going to come. Um, so um, this plus the Isaiah passage, which we read last week, creates this belief that a messenger will come and then the Lord will come. So it's two part. A messenger comes and then the Lord comes. And uh, what is this prophet going to do according to Malachi 4, 4 through 6? What is he going to do? Turn the hearts. Turn the hearts of fathers to their children, children to their parents. So essentially the sense of changed hearts. Um, and the, so the final words of the Old Testament are, I'm sending a prophet, and then I'm coming. Remember the laws I gave Moses. And then that's where it ends. And then we have radio silence, 400 years of radio silence. And God has never been silent before. We talked about that last week, how he'd always spoken. You know, it was Moses, and then it was Joshua, and then it was judges, and then it was prophets during the time of the period of the kings. We had never had a period where God was silent. But suddenly, he's silent. And um, at this point, the people from Judah and Benjamin are living in Judea again. They rebuilt their temple. They rebuilt Jerusalem. But they begin asking, where? is God. Um, so what happens during these 400 years historically? I did go through this last week, but I'm going to do it one more time to recap. So this is the, during the period of returning and rebuilding, it all occurs under the Persian Empire, which is a very stable time period in the ancient Near East. Um, the Persian, the main thing that they bring from Persia is a new language, which is Aramaic. And Jesus often speaks in Aramaic, and he, the Jews get that from their time period in Persia in exile. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great will conquer the ancient Near East for Greece, and he is very favorable to the Jews and allows them a great sense of autonomy while he's reigning. Um, during this time period, a group calls the Sanhedrin forms. The Sanhedrin is going to govern, govern Judea in their civil laws, and that's going to be a big name that we're going to see with Jesus because he's going to combat the Sanhedrin a lot. Later rulers become anti-Jewish. Persecution begins in 175 under Antiochus IV, called Antiochus Epiphanes. And then at 167 BC, um, he desecrates the temple. 
So he actually sacrifices a pig on the altar in the temple. Of, uh, and we all know that pigs were considered unclean. And so that was an animal that was never sacrificed in the temple. So it, it would have desecrated it. He also puts up a statue of Zeus inside the temple. And um, so for three years, they live without a temple. But in 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus and the Hasmonean Jews revolt, and they are able to, this is called the Maccabean Revolt, and they're able to fight back and gain independence. And this is celebrated in what holiday? Do you, Hanukkah, exactly. So this happens during that intertestamental time period. Um, they, at this point, begin to refocus on monotheism. Is it a question? Go ahead. The Maccabeans. Okay. So... Um, do you want me to write that word? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm happy to try. Um, okay. So Judas Maccabeus and then a group called the Hasmonean Jews revolt. And then at this point, the Hasmoneans are actually going to gain control. And if you ever hear the phrase Hasmonean princess, so this is the group of Jews that are going to reign through for a time period. Um, so in 63 BC, Rome is going to take over and they are going to rule the ancient Near East until 135 AD. So the entire period of leading up to Jesus, Jesus on earth, the beginning of the church, all occurs under the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome enforces peace. Also, what's really significant about Rome is that because of its peace, it creates infrastructure. So they demanded peace. Like there was no rebellion that was allowed. And we're going to also see that when we get to um, the time of Jesus being crucified. One of their huge fears is this guy was going to create rebellion and that suddenly they were not going to have their independent nation anymore. So under Rome, um, Judea has a sense of their own independence, but they have to keep the peace. Rebellion is never allowed. So as long as they are orderly and submitting to the Roman government, doing everything quietly, then everything is okay. Um, so there also we get a universal language at this time period. It's Koine Greek becomes a universal language, um, which is also interesting because everyone is really can communicate with each other. So communication increases. Um, at this point, um, the Septuagint is written. The Septuagint is the is a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And so the Septuagint is something that we love as scholars to go back and look at because it is a, such an early translation of the Hebrew scriptures. We're always trying to get back to original meaning and original intention. Um, the scriptures have been translated, and the Jews are so meticulous about um, their copying and their translations and keeping everything accurate. But it is, it's so interesting, you know, if there's sort of a question about a word or um, a sentence, it's very interesting to go back and compare it to the Septuagint because it was such an early source. Does that make sense? Um, so the majority of Jews actually at this point live outside Judea, and because of this, the synagogue is established. So the synagogue is going to be the, um, the point where the Jewish faith is taught. Uh, we're going to see this also when we begin to enter into reading about Jesus. That the synagogues are very, the synagogues um, grew up sort of in, in little enclaves and cities and towns as a way to teach about the Jewish faith. Um, in 37 AD, Rome places a Jew, Herod, in power. So Herod actually gets to be king over Judea, but we're still under the Roman Empire. Um, and at this point, a couple political groups are the, um, rise up and take power. So I'm going to try and write. This is going to be fun. We'll see if this is going to work or not. I'm afraid I'm just going to get tangled up in cords. So, ah! See, this is not going to work, is it? Um, okay. So our, th our groups, and we have the first group is the Sadducees. Can you read that? Maybe not. Okay, the Sadducees. So they are an aristocratic group that included the chief priests and the high priests. And they held the majority of the seats in the Sanhedrin. Um, they agreed with the decisions of Rome. They wanted to keep the peace. They were more concerned with politics than with religion. Um, they were not popular with the masses because they were the elitist group. Um, they're conservative in doctrine, considered only what was written to be God's word, and they denied the afterlife, resurrection of the dead, existence of any kind of spiritual world. So the next group, um, and this is the group that Jesus encounters a lot, is the Pharisees. Is 
Pharisees. Okay, so the Pharisees were actually middle-class businessmen, and though they did not have the majority of the Sanhedrin, they were more, they were the most popular group because they were supported by the majority population. Um, the minority in, uh, they were the minority in the Sanhedrin, but they controlled the decision-making because they had the popular vote. They accepted the written word of God as inspired by God, but also gave wor- weight to oral tradition. So they're going to say things like, well, Moses taught us. So they believe in the oral tradition of Jewish faith as much as the written word of, of their Jewish faith. So their traditions become as important as the word of God. And that's also where we see all these extra laws that they begin to create based on their own Jewish tradition. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, and they believed in the spiritual world of angels and demons. Jesus, we will actually see, will often side with the Pharisees. He just doesn't like the attitude of their hearts. Like, they generally get it right. It's more their heart that he keeps asking questions about. Now, so those are the two groups of the Sanhedrin. So this is the governing body. So now three other political groups developed that are not part of the Sanhedrin, um, but they're still um, active. So we have the... I'm just going to stay in this corner, I think. Um, So we have a group called the Herodians. Um, the Herodians, as you can guess, supported Herod, and um, they aimed to further the cause of Herod's government. They were motivated by fear of the Roman government and, possi- and the possibility of total destruction. So pretty much they just supported Rome, no matter what. Then there was a group called the Zealots, which I always think sounds exciting. So the Zealots were a political party that opposed the Herodians, and they refused to conform to Roman rule. They were very fiery in their nationalistic spirit. Um, spirit. And one of the disciples is called the Zealot. I think it's Simon the Zealot. And so that's what they're referring to, is he's part of this very fiery, revolutionary group of people. And then the last group is the Essenes. So the Essenes, they withdrew from ordinary life. They were monastic I'm going to sit again. Um, very um, mystical in their style of Judaism. Um, and they're the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they removed themselves from society and they wrote down the Word of God and they studied it and they were very focused on just being outside of culture. But because of that, the scrolls were able to um, last for thousands of years, which is amazing. Okay, so. Last sort of like historical note, um, I want to make a note on the temple because we're going to be, and if you want to grab your handouts on the temple, that's great, because um, we're going to talk a lot about the temple in the next 10 weeks. A lot of what Jesus does happens in the temple. So under Herod, there is a massive expansion of the Temple Mount. So there's that one handout I show you, which shows you the size of the temple that Solomon initially created versus the size of the temple that Herod is going to create, which is, like, monstrous in comparison. Um, Herod really wanted to make a name for himself through building projects. So to persuade the priests to do this, he promised that the sacrifices would not cease during the time period of building the temple and that all the priests would do the work. He institutes a tax to, to fund their program, and it really becomes one of the major Um, construction projects of first century ancient Near East. So this huge temple is built. Jesus visits the temple um, during Passover, somewhere between the age about 30 to 33. um, And the Jews at that point comment that the temple has been under construction for 46 years. So we believe the main temple was built, but this temple mount keeps getting expanded and keeps growing. It's renovated between 20 and 19 BC, but it's not completed until about 62 to 64 AD, and then it's destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. So it has a very short time period that is actually 100% finished before it's entirely destroyed. So it's intended to be about 1,600 feet wide, 900 feet broad, and nine stories high with up to 16 feet thick walls, which is crazy. Um, It had a synagogue, a marketplace, an area for women, since women were not allowed inside the main temple. So now if you look at the one that shows the exterior courtyard, 
um, outside of the main temple was an area called the Court of the Gentiles. And this area was essentially a bazaar. So in there, vendors would be selling their souvenirs. There would also be sacrificial animals that you could buy. Um, There's food to buy. And one of the main things that they also have there, which we'll deal with later, is they have currency changers. Because the Jewish people believed that they that the Roman coin was like an abomination to them. They could not buy a sacrificial animal with a Roman coin. So they had to exchange all Roman coins for Tyrian money. So money made from the, the country of Tyre. Tyre. For some reason, Tyrian money was okay. But they were not allowed to coin their own money because that would make them an independent nation. They had to use Roman money. But because they viewed this Roman currency as an abomination, there were all these people outside um, who would be money exchangers. Um, The priests, if you sort of imagine the scene, so only Jews are allowed inside the temple, but in that exterior court of the Gentiles is this huge bazaar that's going on. If you imagine the scene, there's priests in white linens, there are tubular hats, they're everywhere. They're directing pilgrims, they're advising people on the sacrifices. Okay, what did you do? What are you supposed to buy? What sacrifice do you need to bring? So, Because the people didn't necessarily know. So the, the priest would have been there sort of explaining this whole process. And then there was this wall of separation called the Sorig. And that was, uh, and that was separating from where the Jewish people could go inside. So inside the temple area, you could go inside. And that first area is called the Court of Women. So any Jewish person could go inside the Court of Women. Do you have a question? <coughs> no, go. Oh, good question. When did the term Gentiles begin? I think, I don't know, but I think there was always a sense of otherness of Jewish people and non-Jewish people. That's a great question. I'm going to have to get back to you. (laughs) Good question. So in that court of the women was open to all Jews, male and female, including ritually unclean priests and lepers were all allowed inside the court of women. Okay. But then... Only Israelite men could go further inside to the priestly court where they would actually do the sacrifices. Um, And and that only Levite priests could actually do the sacrifices. Okay, so at this point, the ancient Near East is poised for Christ to enter. We have a common language, freedom of travel under Roman rule. The church is going to be able to spread because of Roman infrastructure. The Jews have a semblance of independence, but it's fragile. Only peace is allowed, remember? So it's a very fragile independence. Any disturbance to peace is dealt with harshly. The Jewish people are afraid of any rebellion. They have some independence. They have their functioning temple, but they want to keep the peace at all costs. So the Jews are conquered. They're oppressed. Their faith is polluted. Their hope is low, they're low but their faith, and their faith is really even lower. And so they're convinced that only this promised Messiah can save them. So that's, that's where we're going to enter in. Is there a question over here? No. Okay. So the story of Jesus is told by four different witnesses. Okay. These are our four gospels. So the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the story of Jesus told by four different witnesses. They are not intended to be full biographies. None of these. They're all intended to tell, to convey certain information, to create a theological perspective. What did they want to teach? So the, all of them have the message that Jesus came as God in the flesh as proclaimed by the prophets to forgive, save, and redeem. Matthew, who is, um, is the disciple Matthew, he's called Levi, he's intended for a Jewish audience. So what's, what's great about Matthew and why it's so fun to read after coming out of the Old Testament is he focuses a lot on fulfilled prophecy. So that's going to be one of his big things. Jewish audience, look at fulfilled prophecy. Um, he loves start. He is the one who starts with the, the, the genealogy of Jesus, starting with David. Um, Mark is by John Mark. He's a companion of the disciple Peter. He's considered an eyewitness because he's Peter's companion. And, he's written, and he writes down the words of Peter, the experience of Peter. It's intended for a Gentile non-Jewish audience, and we know this because he explains Jewish customs throughout Mark. So that's interesting. Uh, He focuses on the facts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Luke is a physician and a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's a researcher. He intends to write as much as possible a full account of Jesus's life. He also writes the book of Acts. 
So he wants, he writes the story of Jesus and then the story of the birth of the church. He, it's written somewhere between AD 59 and 63, and likely before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, because it's never referenced. We believe most of the books in the New Testament are written before AD 70, simply because that destruction of the temple was so significant, and none of the books mention it. So that really dates them and their time period. Um, John, the last of the four Gospels, by the disciple John, towards the end of his life, most likely about 80 to 95 AD, uh, AD and it's written that people would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have life in his name. John contains the great Logos prologue and his, the I Am statements, all the statements of the I Am. So we'll get to those. All right. So we've heard this story a lot, the scriptures we're going to read today. I mean, these are probably some of the most familiar scriptures that we have heard. They're read at Christmas Eve services. So what I would love to ask is if, as, as we read these scriptures, if you would just kind of try and pretend that you have never heard them before. Because um, I know it's hard because these are all ones we have grown up with. I mean, there's some scriptures we've read during the study where it's like, what? That happened? Like, but these are very familiar. Um, so just to start, just to set up a framework, let's start with, um, with John. John 1, and it's sort of a prologue about Jesus. And listen in, I'm going to ask you questions. All right, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Skipping over to verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. (coughs) He was in the world, and and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The children born not of natural descent, nor of human decisions, or husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so Jesus describes, uh, sorry, John describes Jesus as the Word. Why? What's significant about that? Why is he the Word? Just jump in. (laughs) You spoke everything, right. So he is the Word of who? God. God, exactly. So, he is described as the embodiment of God's word, the physical, impre- the physical presence of God's word. So what are the characteristics of this word? When was this word created? In the beginning, exactly. It always existed. And notice the language, how it starts. In the beginning was the word. What should that remind you of? Yes, Genesis, the very first words of the Bible in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 1. <coughs> so, John is very specific when he starts with, in the beginning was the word, because it reminds us of Genesis and the beginning of all creation. And where was the word at creation? With God. And what is the relationship of the word to God? It was God. Exactly. What was made through the word? All things. What is, what is in the word? Verse four. Life. And how is that life described? The the light that shines in the darkness, the light of all mankind. (coughs) Yeah, I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. I think I'm just trying to get ahead of my coughs today. (laughs) Um, what, so what do you think the darkness refers to? The light shines in the darkness. What does the darkness refer to? Sin, evil, exactly. And we see the presence of that every day in our world. Thank you, Deanne. Got some water. All right. Um, and this is really, I'll keep it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, awesome. So. Um, the, the light shines in the darkness. 
So remember, we're still in the presence of what I call the the in-between, the partial crushing, right? When we're looking forward to Satan's head being entirely crushed, we live in a time where there is still great evil. And so, but the light shines in the midst of this evil, in the midst of this darkness. <coughs> does, the word recognize, does the world recognize this word of God? And no. And it says his own did not receive him. What do you think that refers to? His own did not receive him. The Jews, exactly, the Jewish people, even his own family. Like, he has brothers and his mom that are like, what are you doing? Like, during the course of his early ministry, he has a few brothers that are converted after his death and resurrection. James is one of them. He's going to become a great writer in the New Testament. But he did not believe that Jesus was Jesus while he was alive. And then, um, for those who do receive him, what do they become? Children of God. And what did the word And what did the word become? It says the word became flesh, which is crazy. And where did it dwell? Amongst us on on earth. Okay, here's a cool fact. So the Greek word that is used for dwell is the word um, skinu. And it shares its root with the word skini, which is tent. So what do you think by that word choice he is referring to. The word dwells among us using the same word for tent. Tabernacle. tabernacle. Exactly. So he's referring to the Jewish tabernacle in the desert when they traveled and God made his dwelling, his tent amongst his people. So this is why we study the Old Testament is because suddenly these, this makes sense to us when we begin to look at the references. So really the word is the word, the word, tabernacled amongst us, which is such a cool reference that God is dwelling in the midst of his people. Jesus is God dwelling in the midst of his people. And what are the characteristics of the word? What two words are used to describe him in verse 14? Grace and truth. truth. Are those words of condemnation? Isn't it so often? I don't know if you guys are like me. But so often, like, I hear, in my mind, I think, God, judgment and condemnation. You know, like, that is not who Jesus is. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. And I love that. Um, so an important concept that John is clarifying is, is Jesus God? Is Jesus human? And that's something that's almost too great for our minds to get. But that's what John is saying. He is both human and and he's God at the same time. Um, so Matthew, who wrote to a Jewish audience, starts his book with a genealogy. And I know I've read parts of this to you ladies, but I'm going to read it to you. And I'm hoping that as you hear it, it will actually begin to make sense to you for the first time. So let's go to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. All right, Matthew 1, the genealogy of the Messiah. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. You guys starting to remember all of this? Isn't that cool? Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram. Jehoram the father of Uziah. Uziah the father of Jotham. Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz. Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah the father of Manasseh. Manasseh the father of Amon. Amon the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father to Sheltiel. Sheltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Remember who Zerubbabel was? He was the, (coughs) what was he of Judea? He was the governor. He was the governor of Judea when they returned after the exile. And he was the grandson of the king. Now, the rest of the names are a little bit obscure, but it goes through a few more, and then it ends with Nathan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. 
So you all, you all know, why does Matthew start with this genealogy? What is the point? To confirm that they are pre-existing prophecy. Right, to confirm that this child that's going to be born, this Jesus, is a descendant of the line of David, the family of Judah, of Judah and that because remember, the Messiah had to come from this line, right? And so it's really important that they trace it back. Now, Luke 3 also has a genealogy of Jesus, and it's different from Matthew. And people ask the question all the time, why are there two genealogies? Why are they different? Matthew shows the direct descent from the kingly line through Joseph, through, um, from Solomon through, um, through David's son Solomon. Luke shows the descent through David's son, Nathan. So it's actually a different son that he's following the descendant of. And he says, in Luke, he says, he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. Many believe that this genealogy is actually the genealogy of Mary because she was the actual blood relation of Jesus, right? Joseph is his father, but is not considered his blood relation. So from Joseph, we get the kingly line and the promise through Solomon. From Mary, we also get the bloodline showing that she is also of the Davidic family. So that's what we believe the two genealogies are confirming. <clears throat> Just before Mary conceives Jesus, another important child is going to be conceived. We learn from Luke that there is a couple, a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, and that they are older and that they are childless. And that Zechariah, he is on duty in the in the temple one day, and he's chosen by Lot to go burn incense and go into the temple. This is the holy place, not the holy of holies. So he's chosen by Lot to go into the holy place to burn incense. And while there, an angel of the Lord is going to appear to him and tell him he's going to have a son. So I'm going to read Luke 1, 15. B. And this is what the Um, This is what the angel says to him. He says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you do not believe my words, which will come true in their appointed time. That just really cracks me up all the time I read that. So <laughs> so I love what Zachariah says. He's like, well, uh, he says, how can this be? And Gabriel says, I am an angel, I'm glowing, like, come on, you know, like, I stand in the presence of God, like, you're not going to believe me, like, if an angel talked to me, I think I would believe him, right, you know, like, like, dude, I'm standing here glowing, so it's interesting, Gabriel's also the same angel that sent to Daniel to help him interpret his dreams, which I think is interesting and cool, um, notice how he is described in verse 17, he will be in the spirit and the power of who? Elijah, this child that is going to be born. And what is he going to do? He's going to turn what? So what should these words remind us of? Malachi, that we just read exactly 400 years earlier. This prophet, the last prophecy is saying, there's a prophet who's going to come and this is what he's going to do. And so when angel Gabriel comes and says, you're going to have a son, his name is going to be John and he's going to be a prophet. He describes him according to the way Malachi described this messenger to come, which is so cool. Um, and he says, what is he to make ready? He's to make ready what? Make ready a people prepared. prepared for the Lord. That's out of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, where it says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So Luke is clearly showing that this messenger is the one that was promised. So remember, there's supposed to be a messenger, and then the Lord will arrive. This is the messenger. So um, Zechariah will go home. Elizabeth will conceive. Um, notice Elizabeth was, reason, was barren for a reason. Not the same that every time barrenness is a reason from the Lord, but we see that God working in this way many times in Scripture, that 
it really, the whole point was to show that John's birth would also be miraculous. A very old woman is going to conceive. So six months later, Gabriel has a message for someone else. So let's pick that up in Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting is this? what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Then even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to, to me be fulfilled. And the angel left her. So. All right. So interesting that Zechariah and Mary, they have similar questions, don't they, in some ways? So Zechariah says, how, what does he say? He says, how can I be sure of this? So what kind of response does this sound like to you? How can I be sure of this? Doubting. Doubting. Totally. I agree. Mary says, how can this be for I am a virgin? What is her, how is her response different? Astonishment. But maybe even just like physically, like... What, how's this going to happen? Like, I've never been with a man. Like, you know, like, really? So, I, I mean, is she saying, like, do I marry Joseph? Like, what do I do? You know, I'm betrothed. So what happens next? So and, um, but how will Mary become pregnant, according to verse 35? What will happen? The Holy Spirit, the power of the Most High, will overshadow her. And I love how Mary responds in verse 38, um, how she says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And what do you think we learn from this response of Mary? Yeah, how we should respond. Yeah, may your word to me be fulfilled. That's just a beautiful like statement of faith, isn't it? So Mary will go on to visit Elizabeth. John will be born three months later. Uh, Zechariah writes on a tablet, his name is John. So that's what the angel told him to say. And at that very moment, his muteness ends, his mouth is opened, and he's able to talk. And so the neighbors marvel at this and say, who will this child be? Because of, he was born to a very old couple, and, this whole, um, and his father wasn't allowed to speak until he named him. So Mary is pregnant. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph. So betrothal back then was actually a formal contract between two families. It was considered legally binding more of a business transaction than sort of a personal or romantic choice. The dowry or bride price would be included at this time of proposal uh, of engagement. And so if an engagement were broken, this dowry or bride price would have to be paid back. So it was already paid. After the proposal, the only things that remained were the party, having a party, um, moving into the groom's house, and the consummation. So if Mary had been sexually intimate with anyone else, it would have, been, would have been considered adultery at this point. So I'm going to read from Matthew 1, 18 through 24. So we're skipping back to Matthew. So this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's quoting Isaiah. 
When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. So Joseph listens to the angel, marries Mary, doesn't consummate until after Jesus is born. Imagine, like, the shaming that both of them must have received. I mean, really, like, she's walking around telling everyone, no, the Holy Spirit did it, you know? <laughs> like, that's – and the bravery, I think, of Joseph – to take this on, I think is really cool to think about. Um, but I guess you don't say no to an angel, right? You know, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so Mary is pregnant with the Messiah. Um, she is engaged to a man named Joseph, but they have a problem. They live in Nazareth. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Exactly. So God is, of course, going to fix this problem. So going back to Luke, Luke 2. One through seven. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. (coughs) And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. I was expecting a child. <coughs> Sorry. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So Joseph goes to Bethlehem. Why? The decree, the census, and who goes with him? Mary. Mary. Right. Um, So they reach Bethlehem. Where do they go? Now, traditionally, we hear that Mary and Joseph go to an inn and get sent away. There's no room in the inn. I think that's in every Christmas story. And then to a barn. But we're not really sure that's actually what happened because Joseph would have had family in Bethlehem because he's from Bethlehem. So he would have had extended family there. So most likely, we would assume that he would have gone to extended family instead of looking randomly for an N. The word translated, you can even see, as I read the NIV test, be, text, because there was no guest room available for them. So the word is Cataluma, which is translated guest room. We've sort of traditionally seen that as N. All right, so now I want you all to look at the pictures of a typical Israelite home, which are on the back side of one of your papers. So this archaeologically is what we know a typical Israelite home would have looked like at the first century. So people slept upstairs. You can see that. Animals would have been downstairs. And this was a way to keep them warm and to keep them safe. So what Luke could be saying is that there is no room in the sleeping area in sort of the guest quarters upstairs, so they went downstairs. And Luke doesn't actually mention there's animals there. We kind of assume that from all of our narratives, but he never says it. We assume that only because there's a manger, which is a feeding trough. Um, So the text says, while they were there, not as soon as they arrived, which I think is interesting. So while they were there, the time came for this baby to be born. And, you know, personally, we're all women here. Birth is messy. Like, I imagine that you probably would have wanted to have it around straw and not your clean bed linens. Like, I don't know. That's me. So it makes sense that it would happen downstairs. So regardless, the point is that Jesus is born in a very humble setting in the town of Bethlehem. But I think for me, I love history and I love sort of looking at, you know, even archaeology. Like most likely this would have been the kind of scenario he would have been born into. So as soon as Jesus is born, God decides to tell the whole world that he's done it. And so who does he go to? I'm going to read Luke 2, 8 through 21. And there are shepherds living, <coughs> excuse me, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. 
Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. <coughs> okay. So... What's interesting about this is that shepherds were viewed as outcasts. They were considered dishonest. They were considered unclean. They lived in the fields. Um, so why do you think God would tell shepherds? Any ideas? I don't think there's a right answer. I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. Why would he tell the outcasts? Why would he tell the people that... <laughs> My mom is offering me a throat drop right now. <laughs> Sure, I'll try it. Excuse all my coughing today. Um, but I just think that's an interesting thing to ponder, right? Why would he tell the shepherds? Why would he tell the people that are sort of outcasts in society? That's who he came for. I love that. He did not come for those who fit in, for those who are important. He came just for the average person. And he says, and we see that established in the very beginning by who he selects. He doesn't go and tell the king. You know, he doesn't tell those the fancy people. He tells the shepherds. Um, and notice verse 11. What is this baby called? And he's and described as what? The what? The Messiah. The Savior. Um, so according to Jewish law, a, wom a woman would have been considered unclean for 40 days after the birth of her child, after a male child. So at the end of 40 days, she's going to go and present the child in the temple. Um, they have to... Every male child had to be bought back, according to Jewish law. Every male child belonged to the Lord. And so they bring this child to Bethlehem at that point, and they present the payment of someone who is poor, which is two turtle doves or two pigeons. So we get the sense that Mary herself was very poor. And um, I won't read it just for time, but there are, there's an old man, Simeon, and a prophetess, Anna, who both were see him when he was in the temple. And we get this great moment where... Um, Simeon says, this child is going to be a light for the Gentiles. So we get this prophecy at his birth of who he's intended for. He's not just intended for the Jewish people, but a light for the Gentiles also. I don't think I can do a throat job. <laughs> it's like, thanks, Mom. <laughs> um, so Luke says that they returned. Um, so Luke, at the end of his chapter, says that they return to Nazareth, and they do, but not yet. So after they go and present Jesus in Jerusalem, they're going to get one more set of visitors. And let's read about this set of visitors. So Matthew 2. So our understanding is most likely after he's presented in the temple, they return to Bethlehem to be with Joseph's family. So Matthew 2. <coughs> After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose. In the east. Sorry. We saw his star when it arose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasuries, their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So, um, question, yeah, Elizabeth. No. Um, yeah, no, it's funny. Like, we piece together the full birth story from all four Gospels. And it's really only Matthew and Luke that tell about his early birth. So John the Baptist, John goes right away to pretty much John the Baptist and Mark too. So they're more concerned with his ministry. So that's why Luke is the only one who actually talks about where he was born in a guest room. Well, we have a lot of like tradition that has developed, but there's really only two of the two books that talk about his birth. It's interesting, isn't it? So um, Herod calls together um, all of his advisors, says, where is this Messiah to be born? And where do they say? Bethlehem. Um, And notice where the Magi find Jesus in verse 12. Where is he? In a house. So uh, we believe at this point he's just, they've stayed in Bethlehem with Joseph's family. Um, It makes sense uh, if they're living with Joseph's family, born on the bottom floor. Um, So many have asked, how old was Jesus when the Magi actually visited? How old was he? So last little bit of scripture for today. So Matthew 2, 13 through 23, we'll finish that, finish the story. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and his vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. When that was said, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because there were no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and get to the land, go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. <coughs> so he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so fulfilled what was said to the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Yes. Um, I think it's referring to um, Rachel as in Rachel and Leah, as in Jacob's wives. She kind of becomes sort of synonymous for like a mother figure of Israel. So Rachel as in sort of all the mothers weeping for their children. Um, okay. So Joseph has a dream. Um, when does he leave? According to verse 14, what does it say? Uh, no, when does he, first Joseph has his dream when they're in Bethlehem. Yes. In that moment. So he gets up during the night right away, leaves. Um, how long do Joseph, Mary, and Jesus stay in Egypt until Herod dies? Um, and this so then based on, oh, so then Herod finds out he's been outwitted and he orders to kill all the boys. How old? Two years old, Two years old and under. Exactly. So this is based on when the Magi saw the star. So the star appears when Jesus is born. So we believe that Jesus may have even been as old as two when the Magi show up on the scene. So most likely he has, you know, was born in Bethlehem. They stay there for a season with Joseph's family. Then they're told they need to flee when the Magi come. And then at that point, they're going to return to Nazareth. And they would go back to Nazareth because that's where Mary's family was. 
because that's where our whole story began. That's where when Mary is still a single woman, that's where the angel appears to her. So we assume that's where Mary's family is. Um, so I was curious. I was thinking, so, so when did Herod die, according to history? And so Herod dies in the year 4 B.C. So scholars think that Jesus was born somewhere actually, actually between 4 and 6 B.C. because of this. So um, most likely probably born even about 6 B.C., the Magi visit about 4 B.C., a few months in Egypt, and then they return to Judea. Herod dies, but they don't return to Bethlehem um, because Herod's son is on the throne. They return to Matt Nazareth, which is where Mary's family is. So we get a full circle, and then Jesus will now grow up in Nazareth and um, become a carpenter like his father. And then that's kind of where we'll pick up next week. Um, so... The text we read today is probably so familiar to you ladies, but um, what I would love for you to think about is what must it have been like to see these events unfold? What do you, you know, what do we learn about God through, about the character of God through these stories? What do we learn about the purpose of Jesus through these stories? What do we learn about the kingdom of God through these stories? What do we learn about the kind of people God cares about through these stories? Um, and for those of you ladies who can stay another 10 minutes, those are the questions I'll have you ladies discuss with a neighbor. Um, and the questions are on your tables, but what do we learn about the character of God, the purpose of Jesus, the kingdom of God, and the kind of people that God cares about based on this first narrative we've had. Thank you ladies for coming. I love our time together.